Dr. Tim Gouge is on the faculty at the Jackson School of Geosciences. He's a planetary geologist. And what Tim's research does is it helps us understand the processes that shape landscapes on different planets. And his field areas include the Earth, Venus, Mars, and others. He has a very wide-ranging field area, and his travel budget is very large. <laughs> so have you ever wondered about things like we just heard about? Is there really water on Mars? Is there really life on Mars? Have you wondered about those things? Have you wondered about how they decide where to land the rocket and deploy those cool rovers that drive around on Mars and where those rovers go? Have you ever wondered about all of that? Well, Tim is actually part of the team that makes those decisions and does the research to carry uh, that research, to carry out the goals of, the, of those missions. So tonight, he's going to tell us about all these things that we wonder about. Please welcome Dr. Tim Gouge. Um, so, thanks to you all for being here. Uh, I'm really excited to, to talk to you tonight about NASA's next mission to Mars, which is really about searching for life on the red planet. So, before we sort of dive into what NASA's next mission is going to do, um, I want to give a little bit of the sort of Mars 101, some basic facts about the planet uh, that sort of set the stage for what we're going to be talking about tonight. So Mars has an average distance from the sun of 1.5 AU, where 1 AU is the distance from the Earth to the sun. And so Mars is about 150% the distance from the sun uh, as Earth is. So farther out, it's the next planet out in our solar system. The day length on Mars is just a little over our day length, so 24.7 hours. And we refer to this as a sol. So it's not a day on Mars, it's one sol. Uh, the orbital period, so how long it takes to complete one revolution around the sun, is uh, about 687 days. So Mars's year is about twice as long, or a little less than twice as long uh, as our year. And the average radius of the planet, so the size, um, is about half of Earth's radius. And that gives it a gravity that's about 40% that of Earth's gravity. So, Mars, right, it's our neighboring planet, and so it's inspired a lot of uh, interest and inquiry over the years, going back, you know, several hundred years when it was observed uh, telescopically. And so this is showing one of the first complete maps of Mars here, um, put together in 1877 by Giovanni Schiaparelli, an Italian astronomer. And he mapped these features on the surface that he termed canali. So these what are what he was observing as what he thought were linear depressions, of which he made no assumption about how they formed. However, the word canali, which he used only, mean, only to mean a linear depression, sounds very much like canals, right? Things we think of as, as human constructs that we use to move water around to our benefit. And so some of the earliest views of what the surface of Mars might look like in detail is something like this, right? <laughs> we have our Martians around here, right? They're planning out their canals here, and they're moving water from the poles down to maybe the more habitable or where life could survive at the equator. And so here's our, our buddy Marvin the Martian, who's in his canal moving around on the surface of Mars. And this idea of the canals on Mars is, was really picked up by the American astronomer Percival Lowell. And there's this really amazing headline. This is an article published in the New York Times in the early 1900s, where it says the headline is, there is life on planet Mars. And it goes on to say in the article how Percival Lowell, who's this expert in the subject matter, declares there can be no doubt that living beings inhabit our neighboring world. He was absolutely convinced that when we saw high resolution images of the surface of Mars, that we would see Martians right, waving up at us with their canals and from their cities and things like this. And so in the, in the sort of mid 1900s, when NASA starts exploring the solar system, they send the Mariner 4 spacecraft to fly by Mars in the middle of the 1960s. And the first images 
they send back are this, right? So if you're expecting canals and civilizations and Martians, this is an incredibly disappointing image, right? <laughs> it's like grainy black and white image of a surface that is mostly covered with impact craters. So these are circular features we see here. These are depressions that form when meteorites hit the surface of a planetary body. And so from this, you know, you might think that, well, actually, maybe Mars looks a little bit more like the moon. So this is an image of the surface of the moon where we see lots of these impact craters here. And this might be more analogous, actually, to what we're seeing on Mars. You know, not a surface like Earth where there are canals and water moving around on the surface, but something more like the, uh, the surface of the moon. But then in uh, the 1970s, you know, NASA keeps pursuing exploration. That first mission, the Mariner 4, didn't image all of Mars's surface. And so they keep sending spacecraft back. And what they find in the early 1970s is the first evidence, the first geologic evidence for liquid water on the planet. Now, it's not present liquid water moving around in canals, but evidence of past liquid water. And in this case, what we see in this image here is a very, very large river valley. So this valley is over 500 kilometers long, which is over 300 miles long. It's more than five kilometers wide. It can get more than a kilometer deep. So a massive feature we're thinking about when we're looking at the surface of Mars. And when we're thinking about what this represents in terms of things that we might be more used to thinking about is this is sort of the analogy we would like to use, right? This is an image of the Grand Canyon, which is this massive feature on the surface of the Earth that over a significant period of time has been carved by the action of the Colorado River. Not our superior Colorado River in Austin, Texas, but <laughs> the other Colorado River, right? So a Colorado River. And this, over significant periods of time, this small river at the base of the Grand Canyon can carve this massive feature on the surface. And so what we're seeing, if you can imagine that all of the water dried up, it would be very easy to preserve this really large elevation feature on the surface, this really prominent feature on the landscape. And so that's what we're looking at here. This is a, a diagram showing you know, that we have done a lot of exploration of Mars. So going from the 1960s up to today, um, everything from flybys, so the first missions were flybys where a satellite whizzed past Mars and collected images of the surface. And then there are orbiters, landers, and rovers. All of the green checks here are successes, so that's good. You can see there's also a lot of these red lines here. These are, are failed missions. Uh, and this sort of diagram goes to show us that planetary exploration is really hard, right? Even though we've gotten to Mars and collected observations of Mars numerous times, it remains a very, very complicated engineering challenge. Um, but what we can see, right, is that the number of red bars is decreasing over time. So we're getting better at it. Um, so Mars today, right, is this cold and dry environment, right? It's not the place you'd want to raise your kids, as we heard earlier. Um, so average surface, like how cold and how dry is it? Average surface temperature is something like minus 60 degrees Celsius or minus 80 degrees Fahrenheit. These are average surface temperatures. So it does get warmer than that at certain locations on the planet at certain times of day. But this is what it is on average across the planet. And certainly it gets colder than this as well. The atmospheric pressure is six millibars. Um, so this is compared to Earth's atmospheric pressure of, of just over 1,000 millibars. So Mars's atmospheric pressure is about 1% that of Earth's. And on Mars, it's predominantly CO2. But one of the things we're really interested in is it's this really dry atmosphere. So what do we mean when we say it's a dry atmosphere? Um, the way we can visualize that is imagine if you took all of that, the gases in the atmosphere and you collapsed it down into one individual layer and you took just the water and you measured the thickness of that layer of water. So how much water is there 
distributed through the entire atmosphere above one place. On Mars, the amount of water in the atmosphere um, is on the order of tens of microns. So this is like the thickness we use to measure human hair. So like that's how much water is in the Mars atmosphere. On Earth, it's obviously time variable, um, but it's closer to centimeters in the Earth's uh, atmosphere. So there's many, many times more water in the Earth's atmosphere than there is in Mars' atmosphere. So this very dry, cold environment that nobody would want to raise their kids in. I certainly would not. But Mars does have a large reservoir of water, actually. It has these polar ice caps. So we can see that pointed out by the blue arrow here. Um, so this is a large reservoir of water, but it's frozen in the, in the solid form, not in the liquid form. And, and we'll come back to this. But when we look at the geology of the surface, so we use uh, geological sciences to understand how worlds change over time and how the surfaces of planets change over time and what the past environments were like hundreds, thousands, millions, or, or in our case, we're going to be talking billions of years ago. So when we look at the past of Mars, we see that it was not a dry place. And so what I'm showing here is more of this example of these river valleys, and here there's a network of them. So lots of river valleys here flowing into a larger river valley here. So this is uh, a feature we see a lot for uh, rivers on Earth. Um, so we know that water carved these large valleys. These valleys flowed into craters to fill up lakes, much like lakes we know, some of them, uh, lakes we know on Earth, some of them were the size of, of small seas on Earth. So really large bodies of water. And we also see evidence of the record it left behind. As water moves across the surface of any planet, it carries with it sediment. So we can think like grains of sand, or little bits of mud that it's moving with the water. And as that water changes its speed or speeds up and slows down, it might pick up some sediment or it might deposit or, or lay down some sediment and form parts of the surface, form sort of new land or new deposits that get locked up in what we call sedimentary rocks. And so we see that a, a significant record of that on the surface of Mars. And, and I'll get back a lot to that uh, as, as we get towards the, the latter part of the talk. So I say, you know, the ancient surface of Mars. Um, it's a reasonable question to say, well, how do you know how old anything is on Mars? Or really, how do you know how old anything is, is on any planet that, that's not the Earth? And so the way we do this is we use meteorite impacts. And so this is a video. Uh, of a very uh, slowed down video of a meteorite hitting an experimental surface in a lab in San Francisco. And so what we can see is that after the crater, it comes in and it hits, and it forms this depression. This is an impact crater. The most famous impact crater we can think of on Earth is the Chicxulub in impact crater, which is studied a lot here at UT in the Jackson School, actually. And this is the one that, that uh, was the main driver, one of the main drivers for, for causing the dinosaurs to go extinct. But we know that meteorites hit planetary surfaces, and they leave behind these craters. And so we can make the argument that, well, if a surface of a planet is sitting around for longer, it's more likely to be hit by lots of craters. Whereas if a surface is very fresh or very young, it won't have had time to have been hit by lots of impact craters. And so we use the number of impact craters on a surface to understand how old it is. So in this example here, the surface on the left has lots of impact craters on it. So we would infer this to be an old surface. Whereas the one on the right has far fewer impact craters, so these two big ones here. Um, but we would infer this to be a much younger surface. And so that's how we can get a sense of relative ages. And we can use this then to say that really most of the liquid water flowing across the surface was very, very ancient. And so how ancient? If we try and put some absolute numbers on it and take together all of our geologic evidence, we can put together a sort of schematic or cartoon like this that gives a depiction of what we think that, or what we infer the water activity, the history of water activity on Mars has been over, over its uh, existence. 
And so on the bottom axis here, we have time in billions of years from just um, earlier than 4.5 billion years when the planet first formed up to today on the right here. And so what we think is that at this time period, right around 3.7 or 3.8 billion years ago, there was this peak in water activity on Mars. So this time is really when we think most of the rivers and the lakes were active. And then since then, it's, it's uh, decreased significantly here. Um, and for most of Mars's history, so going from really about 3 billion years ago to today, Mars has been a pretty dry place. So this is the kind of number uh, that I hope you can sort of keep in your head as, as a framework for most of this talk, that when we're talking about water on the surface of Mars, we think it's sort of 3.7 billion years ago. So really, really ancient surface of Mars. So you know, a reasonable question is, okay, here's some diagram of what we think water activity is. Like, well, like, what happened, right? This is a major question we would like to know. So, so where did all of the water come from, or, or, or where did it go? But what I showed you at the start, right, is that Mars actually has a lot of water. It's just locked up as water ice. And so this is uh, an image of the polar cap, the north polar cap on Mars here. It has a, a southern polar cap as well. It's, it's significantly smaller. But this amount of water ice, so frozen water, is enough to fill the Mediterranean Sea. So this is a significant volume of water, especially when we think you know, Mars is only a quarter the surface area of Earth. So if you put the Mediterranean Sea on, on a much smaller planet, that's a lot of water. So Mars actually does have a lot of water. It's just all, all frozen. And so really the question is, OK, well, where did the, the liquid water come from and go? So, so why is it not liquid anymore? It, we know it was, but it's not anymore. So, so why is that the case? And this really is a question for what the atmosphere might have been like. And, and we want to run into a, a, a very significant problem when we're thinking about what early Mars might have been like and how you could have formed liquid water on the surface. And we have this problem that we call the faint young sun paradox. And so this plot is showing on the vertical axis here, this is how much energy the sun is putting out as compared to today. And on the bottom axis here is time before the present. Again, this is in billions of years. So today is on the right. And so what we can see is that today, the sun is putting out one times today's amount of energy. So it's all relative to today. So necessarily, this plot will end at one here. But what we can see is that over time, the sun has been putting out more energy. And so if we go back to 3.7 or 3.8 billion years, and that's what's indicated by these red lines here, the sun was only putting out about 75% the energy that it does today. So this gets really, really hard, right? If modern Mars isn't able to, to have liquid water, it, it's going to be really hard to do this on early Mars when you have a less powerful or less intense sun. But one of the things that we think was the case for early Mars is that it had a much thicker atmosphere. So an atmosphere closer to Earth's thickness, or maybe even thicker than Earth's modern atmosphere. And so it would have received a much larger greenhouse effect, where the atmosphere can warm the surface. But how much that greenhouse effect could have impacted the surface temperatures is still a, a sort of major unknown. And so there have been proposed these two paradigms or, or two sort of end member scenarios for what early Mars might have looked like. And so the top one I'm showing here is what I might call a, a persistently warm early Mars, where we have precipitation, so like rainfall that's feeding surface runoff, so that rain hits the surface and flows across the surface and flows into rivers, and then those rivers flow into lakes, and then those lakes overspill and they flow into other lakes downstream. And what I'm describing here is a, a hydrologic cycle or a water cycle that looks much like Earth's does today. So this sort of hypothesis 
would suggest that Earth, uh, or that early Mars looked more like Earth today than it does like Mars today. The alternative idea is the one shown on the bottom here, which would suggest that, no, 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 Mars is actually pretty much cold all the time. And all of the water, maybe you had a little bit more water early on, because we do know Mars has lost some of its water over its history. And so maybe you had some more water and enough so that you could have not just ice at the poles, but maybe you had snow and ice towards the equators, which is where we see all of these rivers and lakes. But still, most of the water is locked up as ice. But then you might have some event that occurs that adds energy or increases the temperature of the surface. So you can imagine things like meteorite impacts that come and hit the surface and warm it up a lot. Or you can imagine volcanoes that, um, that add new greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, which cause it to warm up over long periods of time. And from this, you might get um, some infrequent events where some of that water ice is able to melt, turn into liquid water, and cause the geologic activity that we see on the surface today. And so maybe you do this numerous times, so every time there is an impact that hits the surface here, Mars warms up enough to get liquid water, and then it cools down rapidly, and then you have another one, and over time, you can undergo the type of activity that's needed to carve these large river valleys. So these are the two end members um, that we have. A and really, this is where the science that I do is right now. This is where we as a field, and this is like the royal we, everybody that's thinking about early Mars is sort of stuck on these two end members. And this is a really heavily researched question. You know, what was the climate and water cycle like on early Mars? Which of these two end members might it be? You know, it seems not unreasonable to think that maybe it's something kind of in between. But quantifying or testing just how in between, is it a little closer to this one or a little closer to this one? These are the things we want to know. And so at every scientific conference I go to, this question is heavily debated. There's usually an entire conference session, so we spend, as a community, half a day or maybe a full day discussing these questions, and people give presentations on the, on the ongoing research they're doing to try and answer this question. And so, you know, you might think, well, well why does it really matter between those two M members? Like, what, what is the major sort of implication, or why do we care? Um, one of the reasons we really care is because this time period that we think early Mars had a lot of flowing liquid water is a time when on Earth we see some of the first evidence for life being recorded in the rocks that we look at. So right around 3.5 billion years is when we see some of the first evidence for the earliest life on Earth. And we know that water is one of the necessary conditions for life. And, and likely, it's gonna, we think it takes a long time for life to evolve. So whether or not you have a persistently warm surface environment that has liquid water around for millions or hundreds of millions of years, or if it's only an episodically warm environment, these have really big implications for when we think about life or potential life on Mars. And so some of the key questions we have that, that this research leads into is, you know, could the early Mars environment have supported life as we know it? And when we think about whether or not Mars might have supported life as we know it, we often reference this as thinking whether it was a habitable environment. And so we use this word a lot in planetary science, was it a habitable environment? And what that means is that we think that environment was sufficient for life as we know it on Earth today to have existed in that environment and to have survived. That's what a habitable environment is. This is different from the question of, well, was there actually life there? Whether or not life could have survived is different from whether there is life there. And so the, the second really key question is here, here is, did life ever exist on Mars? Even if we have 
habitable environments, but we could have habitable environments, but no life that ever existed. And so these are some of the really key questions we have. So these are like some of the active research questions. And when I say active, I, I really do mean this is stuff that, that me and my research group are thinking about and working on every day. We're thinking about these questions. And lots and lots of people in the scientific community are thinking about these questions. You know, what was the climate and water cycle life on early, like on early Mars? And, and did life ever exist? And planetary geologists, um, such as myself, we look for the answers to these questions in the rocks. And the reason we do this is because rocks record what their environment was like when they formed. And so specifically, my research and the research of my group is thinking about sedimentary rocks. So these are rocks formed by small grains, so sand, pebbles, muds, things like this that squish together and form new rock. And these are really, really interesting because they form in response to fluid movement. So this is a graph trying to depict on uh, the vertical axis here, this is height above some surface. And on the horizontal axis here, this is how fast a current is. So in this example, we can see the currents moving back and forth. So you can imagine water swishing back and forth. And this movement of fluids, like water, gives rise to movement of sediment. So the water can move sediment across the surface. And so that's what the bottom diagram or animation is depicting here. These are examples of ripples, and hopefully you can see on the, the peak of these ripples, there are these sort of um, little swashes of sediment moving back and forth. So this is the sediment movement being driven by the fluid movement. And over time, as this forms a new sedimentary rock, this here, this type of environment, and so things like how much is the fluid moving, what's the speed of that fluid, whether it's moving back and forth, is it only moving in one direction, these are going to be recorded in the rocks. So this is an example here from Oregon. These are the same type of ripple deposits that have built up over time, and these tell us something about what the environment was like when that sediment was deposited. So these were probably in some uh, near to the shoreline part of the ocean, these ripples, and they're moving back and forth, say maybe under tides or something like that. And so, you know, what we like to see is those pictures I had on the, the last slide, right? This is what we like to see. This is an image I took in the field in Oregon. Uh, it's really hard to go to Mars. Uh, I've never been. Um, <laughs> as far as I know, no one has ever been. Um, I'm not sure that. I would want to go, all of the stuff I like is here, but lots, it's really exciting to think about sending humans to Mars because we might be able to, to make observations like this, but in the stead of humans, we can send robots. And so we think of rovers really as Mars field geologists. So these are our equivalents on Mars. And this is not a picture from Mars. This is a picture from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Los Angeles showing an example of a couple of the rovers that have been sent to Mars. And I'm going to talk very briefly here about this one on the right, which is the Mars Science Laboratory, commonly known as the Curiosity rover. And this is a, a really impressive uh, mission. It landed in, on Mars in 2012 and has been doing some incredible science. And, and two of the, the really exciting findings from MSL is, the first is when it looks at these rocks, this is an image from Mars here, when it looks at these rocks, it's able to tell that they were deposited in a lake, and not only a lake, but a lake that had the right chemistry such that it would be a habitable environment. So these sediments were deposited about three and a half billion years ago. And so if you went back to Mars and went back to this lake three and a half billion years ago, you could plop life down there and it would be able to survive. So it would be a habitable environment. The other incredibly exciting thing that MSL has found is it has identified complex organic molecules. And when we say complex organic molecules, or really any organic molecules, we don't necessarily mean something that formed from life. 
what we mean is something that has carbon in its structure. And these type of molecules can be formed either through biotic processes, so that's from life as we know it, or they can be formed through abiotic processes. So these are types of ways you can form organic molecules that don't involve life. So just normal geologic processes can form these organic molecules. But what this discovery has shown us is that lake deposits on Mars can preserve these type of molecules, which might give us an indication of past life on Mars. So we know that those rocks can preserve this evidence. Now the question is, well, was there ever life on Mars? And if so, is it preserved in the rocks? So this is an incredibly exciting question that the next Mars rover is actually going to try to address. So NASA's Mars 2020 rover is going to be the first to explicitly search for evidence of potential past life. So it's going to explore rocks on the surface and be looking for evidence of past life. Furthermore, one of the incredibly exciting things beyond that is that this is a, the first in a series of proposed missions to actually try and bring samples back to the Earth. And so the Mars 2020 rover has a number of science instruments. One of the instruments it has is a drill, and this drill will collect a number of samples, so a couple dozen samples, each about the size of a pencil, all drilled into the rock. So this is what it might look like here. And these rock samples are going to be sealed up and stored on the surface and hopefully brought back in the future. And so the way you do this is really complicated because it's really hard to bring stuff back to Mars. It's super hard to get stuff to Mars and then to bring it back, like, oh no, we want that back actually. That's very complicated. And so this is a proposed mission architecture or a proposed set of missions that would actually do this. And so the first part of that shown on the left here, this is the Mars 2020 rover that you might be unsurprised to learn will launch in the year 2020. This will land on Mars in the year 2021, so early 2021. And then it will drive around and collect the samples and then deposit them on the surface, so put them somewhere on the surface. A second mission that has been proposed will launch from Earth, land on the surface, and grab the sample. So it is, has uh, associated with it what we call a fetch rover. It will fetch the samples and then launch those sample into Mars orbit. So that's what's shown here. It will launch the samples off the surface of Mars, and those samples will sit in orbit around Mars until a third mission comes from Earth, flies by, grabs the samples, and brings them back to Earth. So I don't think it's a stretch to say this is an ambitious scientific feat, <laughs> but it is an incredibly important one because what we want is samples from a known location that we can analyze with all of the capabilities we have in all of the world's labs. And those samples will be available for new technology that comes online for years to come. So this is an incredibly important part of Mars exploration that will really help towards addressing the question of where might we, uh, or whether or not there was life on Mars. So like I said, this is an ambitious idea. Um, and so we might want to be careful about where we send this rover to look and where we get those samples from. So how do we choose where to, to send this rover? Um, this is not how we choose, right? <laughs> this is not how we do it. Uh, I would make the argument, though, that if you did it like this, you'd probably find something interesting because Mars is really interesting. Sort of everywhere on Mars is really interesting. But this is not going to fly, right? This is not going to be OK. And so what we do is scientists that are studying the surface of Mars using data from satellites, they will come and advocate for sites, sites that they think would best fulfill a predefined set of scientific goals that Mars 2020 has. 
And the goals are listed here, and I'll sort of summarize. The first is we want to characterize the geology of a place that might have been habitable, or of a place that is astrobiologically relevant, so it might be compelling to be habitable. Then the second is that we want to see was it habitable, and also look for potential evidence for past life in units that we say have high biosignature preservation potential. And basically what this means is that we think those rocks would be likely to preserve evidence of life if life was there. And then the third goal is to collect uh, a really interesting, scientifically interesting set of samples. And so, you know, people advocate for these sites, scientists, and there's a series of workshops that the community holds where anybody can come, anybody in the science community can come and propose a site. Um, and so there were four open workshops starting in 2014. Um, in 2014, I was finishing up my PhD. I'm working on this site, Jezero Crater, here, which is, which is right here. Um, I was doing uh, one of the chapters of my dissertation on this, and my advisor suggested, you know, you should propose this site. It's really interesting, and the community might be interested in it. So I was very nervous, and I said, okay, I'll do this. Um, but it was really amazing, because this community set of workshops gives everybody equal time. And so I was given the same amount of time as any famous professor from wherever. So all of Anyone who wants to propose a site that they think is scientifically compelling is given the time to do so. And so there were over 30 sites at the first workshop um, shown across the surface of Mars here. And then everybody gives their 15-minute presentation over a series of a couple days on why they think their site is interesting. And then literally we vote. This is a picture from the second workshop. Someone took this picture. You think, OK, NASA, like really engin advanced engineering. It's like, no, it's hold your hand up if you think this site is good. <laughs> it's not so simple as, you know, yet do you like this site or not. We have a specific set of criteria that we vote on. And so this is the actual output. Maybe this looks more familiar of what you might think of as NASA, like a tiny table with lots of numbers. <laughs> but these are just really the results of the vote, where green is good and red is bad, or red is less preferred. And so these columns are the specific criteria that we were given to vote on. So like, do you think this site, uh, we would be able to characterize the geology? That's like one of the questions. And the sites were narrowed down. And ultimately, in November of 2018, um, this information is fed to the NASA administrators and the Mars 2020 science team. And they made the decision to uh, go to Jezero Crater, which is the site I was working on. So, yeah, yeah. That's very kind. Um, <laughs> this was really exciting, though, right? This is, I've been working on this site for almost five years at that point. So I thought it was the best site, although there are lots of really interesting places. But I'm biased. But they agreed with me, so that was cool. Um, and this site, so now in the last sort of, uh, part of the talk, I'm going to talk through why we think this site is interesting. So it's about 45 kilometers in diameter. It's an impact crater. It has two of these river valleys that flow into it here and one that flows out. And so this configuration tells us that this must have held a standing body of water or a lake, something like the size of Lake Tahoe or Lake Winnipeg. Um, and we know that the timing of this is right in that period of peak water activity on Mars. This site has three main units of interest um, within what we call the landing ellipse. So this is where we think the rover is going to land. And I'll talk you through each of those units and what we might hope or what we do hope to find there. So the first is this sort of gray unit across most of the landing ellipse. This is what we call a mafic floor unit. What, what we mean by that is mafic minerals are minerals that we mostly associate with volcanism. And so we think this unit is some type of potential lava flow or maybe a volcanic ash from explosive volcanism. So we think like Mount Pinatubo is erupting and depositing a lot of volcanic ash. And this site is really interesting because units that have within them mafic minerals or volcanic units 
are really easy in the labs on Earth to get a really precise age on. And so if we're able to bring samples back from this unit and get a precise age, we can use that to tie all of the ages on Mars because this will be a very precise age from a known location. We don't have any of that right now. So our absolute timeline on Mars is actually tied to Apollo samples. So this would be a, a major, really exciting advance. The second un unit has, uh, is shown in these sort of dark forest greens here. This is a unit that has the mineral carbonate in it, which is the main component of limestone as we know it on Earth. And it's been proposed that this might be a lake deposit, in fact. But why carbonate is really exciting is because when it forms, it incorporates into its structure part of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And so this, if we can bring these samples back, would tell us something about what the atmosphere was like when it formed over three and a half billion years ago, we think is the age of this deposit. It also records something about the water it was interacting with, so things like the chemistry and the temperature of the water. We could get from really detailed chemical analyses of these samples. But the real key part of why uh, we were advocating to go to Jezero, and I think ultimately a major reason why it was picked, is this feature that I showed in one of the first slides, which is this delta deposit here. And so what's the delta? Um, for those that uh, aren't familiar, a delta forms when a river, and so this is an example of the Mississippi River, and this water is brown in color here, it's not clear, because that water has within it a lot of sediment, so a lot of mud. And when that water that's moving quite fast in the Mississippi enters the Gulf of Mexico here, so this is the Mississippi River Delta, here's New Orleans here, right there, that water slows down very, very quickly. And what that does is it means the sediment stops moving and that sediment is deposited. And that forms new land in this delta deposit. So this is the Mississippi River Delta. We might also think of the Nile River Delta as a very uh, famous example of this. And so this deposit formed when the river that was entering the Jezero Crater Lake deposited sediment and layers of sediment more than three and a half billion years ago. And what I'm going to show you next is a three-dimensional view of what we think the surface is going to look like as if we're the rover here and we're looking at this portion of the deposit. So the rover's here and it's looking here. And what we see is this. So hopefully everybody can see these sort of lineations or these benches here. These are sedimentary layers exposed over 60 meters, so a really impressive stack of sedimentary layers. And these layers record what the ancient Martian surface environment was like when they formed over three and a half billion years ago. And so the Mars 2020 rover is going to drive up these layers and be able to read them much like a storybook of how that surface environment evolved over time. The other super exciting thing about deltas, and one of the reasons it was really interesting to go to for thinking about preserving potential organic matter, is that on Earth, river deltas collect and concentrate organic matter from across their entire watershed into very specific layers. So these brown things here, these are what we call sediment plumes, that sediment coming out from the river here, and they're carrying with them uh, these plumes are carrying with it organic matter. And these concentrate in specific layers, and so Jezero was collecting water. Here is Jezero in the bottom right here. And this larger black outline, this is the watershed or catchment of the Jezero crater. So any water that fell within this area would have eventually flown into Jezero, carrying with it sediment and potentially organic matter, any organic matter that's sitting there. And so this is really large. It's over 10 times the size of Travis County. So a huge area from which sediment is being collected and potentially organic matter. And this is a diagram on the, on the top left here from Earth where we know that organic matter concentrates in very specific layers in the deep parts of the lake. So right in here or in here in these units that we call bottom sets. And we know that these are exposed in the Jezero Delta. And so these are going to be accessible to the Mars 2020 rover, the sort of best places 
where we think organic matter might be concentrated and collected, at least drawing analogy from Earth. And so, like I said, uh, Mars 2020 is going to launch later this summer, and it's going to begin exploring Jezero Crater in February of 2021 is when it will land and it will start exploring and answering some of these really interesting and fascinating questions. So please stay tuned for, for more exciting results that I'm sure are to come from February 2021 for many years to come. And with that, I'll end and I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Tim. We have a number of questions through the uh, Slido app. So if you want to ask a question, it's slido.com. And then type in hot, the HSCT for Hot Science Cool Talks 123. This is the 123rd Hot Science Cool Talk. All right? So yeah, well, here's, here's the most popular question on there. If you colonize Mars, will you burn the ice packs? Sorry, if so, sorry, I didn't, I, if you colonize Mars, will you burn the ice packs? If so, how? Oh, if we colonize Mars, would we melt the water ice? Um, to be honest, I don't think about that all, all that much, about colonizing Mars. It seems like a, a really challenging uh, thing to do. If you did, you would want to melt the ice. That, that would be the major source of water uh, ice on the planet. So I don't know how one would propose to do that. It's an interesting thing to think about, and again, an interesting engineering challenge. Another question comes from uh, someone called Rocket Man. How much, how much radiation is there in the surface of Mars, and it is, is it a dangerous level for long-term exposure, even with some shielding? So Mars, in the modern, has a very high level of radiation because it doesn't have a magnetic field. Earth has a magnetic field that shields us from a lot of the radiation. Mars doesn't have that in the present. And so levels of radiation are very, very harmful on the surface of Mars. Um, we know Mars used to have a magnetic field very early in its history. That timing is a little um, trickier to understand. Um, and so this is a question, you know, might Mars not, if Mars we find did not evolve life, this might be a reason why the radiation levels might, might have been too high. All right, we'd also like to get some questions directly from uh, if you're a middle schooler or a high schooler, if you go right to that spot right there and line up, we'll bring the mic to you and you'll be able to ask questions. Even if you're in elementary school. All right, so here comes you have a, a question. I think there's yeah. a question down here. Okay, well let's, you don't have to go up there, we'll just give it right to you. Why the 2020 Mars mission rover? Why can't it just be in three segments? Oh. Like being one huge. Why, why can't it all? Why can't it just split in three segments? That's my question. So the, the question is why um, are the three missions split up? It's a really good question. And the answer is really what it comes down to is it's really expensive. And so it's hard to get all of the money all at once to do all those missions at once. At once. We would love to do them all at once. That would be awesome. Um, so if anyone has you know, seven or eight billion dollars, let me know and we can try and do them all at once. But that's the real reason. We would love to be able, that, because you're right, it's the, why, why wait? Why do you need to wait? We, we don't actually accept that it's, it's really expensive and hard to do, yeah. Okay, while we're waiting for students to gather right there at the top step, we'll take another question from Slido. This comes from, Faint Young Sun, S-O-N. Uh, what can I do in school to one day join the team that picks the landing sites for Mars? That's a great question. Um, be curious, that's what I would say. Science, I, th I think science is mostly about curiosity and not MSL curiosity, intellectual curiosity. Wondering how the world around us and the universe around us works. And, and how did it get the way it is? And, and how might it evolve in the future? So that's what I would say. Be curious about things. Ask questions. Try and learn more. That's really what science is all about, is asking questions and asking questions that we don't have an answer to and trying to find that answer. So that's what I would say. Stay all right, curious. Great. Tim, Anna has a question for you. Yeah, right on. 
So if there's no magnetic force on Mars, can you use a compass on Mars? Oh, that's a really interesting question. So if, if Mars doesn't have a magnetic field, could you use a compass? The answer is no. It, the compass would not do anything. It would not align to a, a magnetic north. You could have over, you know, probably over four billion years ago when it did have a magnetic field, you might have been able to, but now it would be uh, not, there, there would be nothing for it to align to. Yeah, that's a really interesting idea. Thank you, Anna. Why don't you tell us your name and ask a question? Um, I'm Quinn, and uh, I was wondering what the other candidates for the um, Mars 2020 rover landing site were? So there were, yeah, so, um, well, we started with 30, and then at the last landing site workshop, we were down to three. So it was Jezero, a, a site that is actually very near to Jezero, that we think um, it's called Northeast Sirtis, um, and it's a place that we think is some of the oldest rocks on Mars. So even older than what's preserved at Jezero Crater. So maybe like four billion years old. So this would tell us about the really, really, really early history of Mars, even before that surface liquid water. And what we see there is a lot of evidence for sort of the chemical interaction of water with the rocks. So that would have been a super interesting site as well, and answer a, a totally different and uh, uh, complementary set of questions. And then the third is uh, actually Gusev Crater, which is the site where the MIR, the Mars Exploration Rover, which uh, launched in the, the mid-2000s, it explored there and found some really interesting um, deposits that we think are similar to like hot spring deposits. So like we think Yellowstone type hot hot spring deposits, which we know in, on modern Earth are, are like teeming with all these really interesting types of life. So that was the third site. There were all actually really different types of environments on, on Mars. And so there was a lot of debate. It, we were comparing very different sites. And so, um, yeah, they're all really interesting. So Tim, what your remarks now relate to uh, another question here on Slido. Uh, as the number of sites were being narrowed down, were you getting increasingly, increasingly nervous? Ah, uh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, because I had to present every time, right? <laughs> and so, <laughs> um, but all, the, the ner nervousness comes with it, excitement of like, okay, it goes from 30 and then it goes down to eight, and okay, this is, this is cool. And then it goes down to three and you think, wow, we might send a rover to a place I've spent five years thinking about. This is really cool, but also don't mess up the presentation. <laughs> um, so yeah, nervous for sure, but mostly excited. Um, my name's Parker, and I was wondering if you think that there's life on Mars? If I think there's life on Mars. Um, I'm not sure. Um, I don't know. I, I really honestly don't know. I, w I would be amazed to learn there was life on Mars, but I'm not sure from a science standpoint, I would be surprised one way or the other. So I, I am pretty um, undecided. I, I really don't know. I think it was an environment that could have evolved life, and I think not identifying life would be just as interesting of why is Earth so special that it was a very similar environment to Mars, but Earth was able to evolve life. So I think that would be just as fascinating. So yeah, it, it's, it, that's the question, though. Um, my name is Roman, and how should we melt ice on Mars if the um, atmosphere is so cold? So how would, we, how would we try and melt ice on Mars? We would, the atmosphere is really cold. The surface is really cold. We'd need to bring with us some other source of heat. So like we could bring with us, um, the Mars rovers are powered actually by things like a nuclear power plant. They have a miniature nuclear power plant in there. And so you could take that and turn that into a lot of heat and use that to melt. So we would have to bring some type of energy to heat up that ice from somewhere else because otherwise it's, it would be too difficult to do. Thanks. Tell us your name and your question. My name is Rosie, and I'm wondering about how old is Mars? How old is Mars? Mars formed when most of the planets 
in the solar system form. So our solar system is a little over 4.6 billion years old and like very quickly after that. So over four and a half billion years old is the planet. Your name. Um, I'm Elliot Nutt and I was wondering, um, so the three missions to get the samples and then bring them back, how long is this all gonna, like, gonna take? <laughs> Your guess is as good as mine. Um, the proposed idea is to try to have samples back uh, on Earth by the 2030s or maybe 2040s. So I assume when you're a Mars scientist, you'll be the one analyzing the samples. Thank you. Your name? Gus Swanson, I was wondering, are there any other major major deltas on Mars, and if so, is Jezero the, the biggest one? Is it like the most important delta on Mars? Oh, that's a great question. There are uh, a number of deltas on Mars. Um, it's not the biggest one. What it does have is all of these other interesting units associated with it. It's also what we call well exposed. So those layers that I showed you, those are some of the nicest examples of layers on Mars in a delta. But I actually have a graduate student working with me right now, Michelle Tebold, who's asking that question. Are there, how many other deltas are there on Mars and where are they? It's something we know some of them, but we don't really have a good catalog of all of them. So we're still actually trying to answer that one. So no, it's not the biggest. It's definitely my favorite. I don't know also that it's the most important, but it is a really interesting one. Reminds me of a question on uh, Slido here. Are you looking for summer interns? Am I looking for summer interns? All, always looking for interested summer students. Please contact me, tgouge at jsg.utexas.edu. Hi, I'm Hayden. Um, if you had to make a prediction, what do you think Mars 2020 is going to find? Do you think you could find organic matter? Like, what are the chances? I think it will find at least what MSL Curiosity has found. So evidence of a habitable environment, and I think it will find preserved organic matter. Whether or not that organic matter is biologic in origin or from life, again, I, I really don't know. I'm 50-50. Um, I know a lot of people hope that it will find evidence for life, but whether or not it is, again, like your, your, your guess is as good as mine. We'll take one more. Yeah. So I watched like a video on how Venus is formed, and because like there's proof that organic matter has been on Venus and Mars. Do you think that humans are late to the party? Oh, that's really interesting, yeah. Um, and not just on, on Venus and Mars, some of the meteorites we have, so some of the fragments of meteorite impacts that we collect on Earth actually also have organic matter. Those we can show are not from life but we do have organic matter that we think is from really early in the solar system's history. So b definitely before humans, but also probably before life on Earth, we had these organic molecules. And so I kind of think, yeah, that's a, that's a good interpretation that the abiotic organic molecules were here before the biotic or biologic organic molecules. Yeah, definitely. <laughs>